Hey everyone, and thank you for checking out this message today. I'm Reed Robinette, I'm the senior pastor at Crossroads Church in Maryland, and we hope this message encourages you and challenges you. We believe that everybody has a next step of faith to take, and I hope this message helps you take yours. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone. So glad that you're here as we are continuing in our series, Summer of Soul Care. And uh, we're going to read a passage today right off the bat, um, Luke 17. And we're going to read it all the way through right now. And then we're going to walk through it one piece at a time. Uh, Passage Luke 17, starting in verse 11, says this. Jesus went on his way to Jerusalem. He was passing between the countries of Samaria and Galilee. As soon as he was going into one of the towns, ten men with a bad skin disease came to him. They stood a little way off. They called to him, Jesus, teacher, take pity on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the religious leaders. As they went, they were healed. One of them turned back, and when he saw that he was healed, he thanked God with a loud voice. He got down on his face at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. He was from the country of Samaria. Jesus asked, were there not ten men who were healed? Where are the other nine? Is this stranger from another country the only one who turned back to give thanks to God? When Jesus said to him, get up on your way and go on your way, your trust in God has healed you and made you well. So I want to just, I want to ask you, what if I told you this morning that there was something that it's been discovered in science that is the leading indicator that will predict your quality of life. It'll actually predict whether or not you struggle in life or whether or not you have a great life and you live a happy, fulfilled life. What if I told you that there was something that was going to um, relieve depression in your life, lower anxiety in your life, your relationships would be better if you lived this out in your life, and university studies over the last couple decades have proven again and again and again the far-reaching impact of this in your life, and the best part of all of it is it's free. Probably many of you may have already guessed it, I'm talking about gratitude this morning, gratitude. And today we're in our series called Soul Care. And I want to take a look at this truth that your soul, whether you realize it or not, is desperate for needs gratitude. And what we've done in this series is we've looked at soul care over the last couple weeks is we've looked each week at a different thing that your soul desperately needs that you need at a soul level. And if there is one thing that your soul really needs, it's gratitude. In fact, the Hebrew term for gratitude literally means recognizing the good. It's not pretending that life is never bad or that there's not problems in life, but it's choosing to focus on, to recognize, to call out the good in life. And when you do that, it actually sustains your soul. And it actually lifts us up into the very presence of God. And so the gratitude, this gratitude in our lives sustains our soul. It's healthy for our soul. It's good for our soul. But then the flip side is also true. That ingratitude, it turns out, is toxic for the soul. And most of us would say, oh, yeah, ingratitude, that's terrible. Like, you know, none of us vote for ingratitude. In fact, most of us would say, good thing I'm a really grateful person, you know? Good thing I've got this gratitude thing figured out. Uh, And so, in fact, if I were to ask, you know, like, raise your hand if you're really ungrateful. I don't think, none of us would be like, oh, team ungrateful. Yeah, for sure. I mean, not... All of us think that we're pretty good at gratitude. In fact, they've done some studies that show that most of us perceive our level of gratitude as much higher than it actually is, and they call this the gratitude gap. Uh, And it's true in almost all of our lives. In fact, this is the the key result of a study Berkeley did. The gratitude gap, 90% of people describe themselves as grateful, but only 52% of women and 44% of men express gratitude on a regular basis at all. Um... Some of the women are like, see, amen, I knew it. (laughs) Look at that scientific proof. They're like nudging their husbands. Watch it now. Okay, listen, 52% is not really that good either, okay? I'll just be honest for a second here. 
But look, I mean, this is true. I mean, all of us, even if you feel like you're one of the 52%, you know, all of us could and should grow in gratitude. All of us could get better at gratitude because gratitude really isn't natural. It takes a little bit of work. It's not intuitive. It's not fluid. It's not instinctive. And so often what happens in our lives is that we go through life and we withhold gratitude from people around us and from God but we don't even realize that we're doing it. And can I just say, if there's one thing that is terrible, is toxic for a relationship, if there's one thing that will short circuit a relationship faster than anything else, some of you ex- have already experienced this in your life, it's ingratitude. Like, like to, if you want to just ruin a relationship quick, be completely ungrateful for that other person. In fact, to put it bluntly, few things sting worse than ingratitude. Why? Because ingratitude, what it really is saying to that person is, I don't see you. I don't care about you. What you did didn't matter. I don't value it. It kind of says, you know what? I, I kind of deserved that, actually. You owed me that. I was entitled to that. This is kind of an entitlement mentality. So why would I thank you for that? That destroys a relationship. Now, if you've ever been in this awkward scenario where someone has kind of has been ungrateful in your life, it is really awkward, maybe even impossible to point out ingratitude in someone else. Like that's an awkward conversation. Hey, you know, I don't want to, you know, it's a little weird, but you didn't say thank you. It kind of seems strange for us to say that. It feels a little awkward for us to even point that out. But for us, when we see it in someone else's life, it's like flashing. It's so obvious. It's so easy to see, but the person is, is oblivious. The person is blind to it to this gratitude gap. And the same thing is true for us in our lives, whether you realize it or not, that other people see ingratitude in your life, but you are, whether you realize it or not, completely blind to it. There's a picture of this, Luke 17. We read the passage already. It's one of the clearest pictures of gratitude in the scriptures. And I want to walk through this story together. And Luke, who thoroughly investigated the life of Jesus, explains and describes this encounter, verse 11 of Luke 17. Jesus went on his way to Jerusalem. He was passing between the countries of Samaria and Galilee. As he was going on to one of the towns, 10 men with a bad skin disease came to him, and they stood a little way off. Now, this bad skin disease that they're talking about here is what we know now, uh, leprosy. And the good news is that you probably don't have a lot of experience with leprosy. That's because medical, has, medical science has advanced so, to such a degree where we don't really have to deal with this, and the world has been mostly cured of this terrible disease. But at this time, leprosy was like the worst news that you could get. It was a scourge on humanity at this time in this uh, season of, of, uh, of history. It could strike anyone at any time, and you could imagine you would get this little spot on your skin, and you knew what that meant. You knew that that was a death sentence. You knew what was going to happen after that. In fact, the lepers at the time were like literally the walking dead. They were like, they were like half alive, half dead. It was horrendous. It's hard to even talk about. Without going into too many details, leprosy slowly deteriorates your skin and your body. And it starts with the extremities, your fingers, your nose, your face, your toes, and it would slowly progress until even whole pieces of your body would fall off. And eventually it would start to consume the inside of your body out. Terrible. I mean, that is a horrendous thing to think about, to have lived through. But if you think that that, that's bad, the physical pain is bad, the only thing worse than the physical pain was the social pain. See, the physical impacts of leprosy, it would take a while to develop. Slowly over time, many years oftentimes, but the cultural impacts, the, the social impact were immediate. As soon as you, it was discovered that you had leprosy, you were banished. You were outcast. You were pushed out. You could not be a part of the community. You could not be a part of society. You were a social outcast. In fact, there were leper colonies. They would push these people into the fringes, leper colonies. And so just imagine having received this diagnosis for a second. From the moment that you found out that you had leprosy, you could never go to another one of your kids' games. You could never go to another one of their birthday parties. You were going to miss their graduation. If you were a kid, you're never going to get to see your parents again. 
and you, you were never allowed to go into the market to, to be a part and, and grab food from, from the market. You were never allowed to have hygiene and be in the community around you. In fact, the Levitical law dictated that any time a leper was around anyone, anyone else in public, they had to start the conversation from a distance by shouting, unclean, unclean. Oh, can you imagine your whole life? Anytime you ever interact with anyone, you start the conversation by shouting and and holding up a sign saying, unclean, unclean. And so Jesus is walking to Jerusalem and he comes across these 10 lepers And it was probably a little bit like walking corpses that he sees. And they start to approach him, but they know that they can't get too close to him because they're not allowed to. And with desperation, they shout this, verse 13 says, They call to him, Jesus, teacher, master, take pity on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the religious leaders. As they went, they were healed. It's interesting that they use this word teacher. A lot of translations say master because, I mean, they hardly really knew who Jesus was. You have to imagine, like, why? That's kind of a strange thing to say to someone, to call Jesus right off the bat, to call him teacher, to call him master. But you have to imagine, I don't know, I have to imagine that the leper colonies, they probably had some conversations with each other and the, and the reputation of Jesus had maybe started to, to get out. They were hopeless. There was no chance for them any other way. There was no chance for healing. And so for them, they heard, oh, there's this guy, Jesus, and he's a miracle worker and he's healed people. And they start hearing about this person, Jesus. And then they found out, they hear that Jesus is walking through. And so they go and they find Jesus and with desperation, they begin to shout out, take pity on us. You're the only shot we have. You're the only hope we have. A miracle is the only hope we have. There's no like John Hopkins study happening right now that could help these people. And so they needed a miracle. And it says here that Jesus saw them. And that by itself is pretty amazing because these people, that was, a, that was a miracle in a way all by itself because their whole point of leper colonies was to push them out so that they would be unseen. Because no one wanted to look at these people. No one wanted to see these people. In fact, they wanted them to be conven- conveniently out of public view. Who wanted, who wanted to see a bunch of people that were that sick? No one wanted to be reminded of lepers. And so, but Jesus, he did this again and again in his ministry. He always saw the people that no one else saw. He always paid attention to the outcast. He always noticed the person that no one else noticed and that everyone else missed. And so maybe maybe you need to hear this today. Maybe you feel like you are on the outside looking in. Maybe you feel like there's something going on in your life. No one else knows about it. No one else sees it. No No one else realizes it. You're suffering and no one sees you. And if that's you in the room, maybe you're not even in the room. You don't even feel like you want to come to church. You're watching online right now. If that's you today, Jesus sees you. Jesus cares about you. And again and again, this was true, and it's true even still today, that Jesus always goes after the one that's on the outside, always goes on the one and finds the one that no one else sees. And so then Jesus, he sees them from a distance, and he shouts, go, go. And at first they heard the word go, and their heart probably skipped a beat. They're like, here we go again. You know, they're gonna, he's going to tell us to go, get out of the way, to go back to the leper colony. They were used to hearing this word go. Go, get out of, scatter, get out of my way, right? You're not welcome here. So go was like the, that was what they were expecting to hear. But then they weren't expecting this next thing. Instead, they heard something different this time. Instead, they heard go and present yourself to the priests which was very confusing to them. They were probably like, "Um, go to the priest and present and show myself to the priest. Show them what? Like my my leper-ridden skin? Like, I mean, what what am I going to show them? I haven't been healed yet. Like, what what, what exactly would I be going to the the priest for? We haven't been healed yet. But there's a part of this that Jesus, he knew this at the time. When you had leprosy, the only way that you were able to re-enter back into society and to be a part of community again was if you were healed, that you would go to the priest and the priest would verify and confirm that, in fact, you were free and clear from leprosy. It's almost like um, if you've ever been sick and you have to go get a doctor's note to return back to work. It's kind of that idea. And so part of what Jesus is saying, oh, you want to be healed? Done. You might as well start walking and talk to the priest because you're going to get healed. 
And so, but the temple, and for the lepers at the time, the last place they wanted to go was the temple. The last place, they, the last person they wanted to see was the priest because they assumed that judgment was coming. But here's the deal. Despite that truth, they acted on Jesus' Jesus's promise before it was their present reality. They were looking down and they're like, we're not healed. But Jesus seems to be promising that we're going to be healed. And so they acted on this promise before it was their present reality. And maybe that's a word for some of you here today. And it says, as they went, they were healed. As they went. I know, I wonder what that was like. I, I wish I was there for that, for that walk. Like, I don't know, was it like slowly progressive over time as they were getting closer? Like, they're like, man, I think this spot used to be bigger. And now it seems like it's, do you see this? And like, oh my gosh, my arm is clear. And then they're getting like more and more excited as time goes on. And they're just like jumping up, high-fiving each other. And they're like, this is amazing. And they're walking to the priest. And so you can imagine then maybe after that, you know, they finally, they talk to the priest and they're able to re enter and, and to go back into the city. And they're calling their mom. They're like, mom, you're not going to believe this. I'm coming home, you know, make some chicken pot pie or something. I don't know. You know, the, the story, it, you know, it could have ended right there. They all went on with their lives happily ever after. Would have been a great end of the story. But one of them realized that they, that the story couldn't end there. They, he realized that they needed to close the gratitude gap and they needed to go back and thank Jesus. And so for this one out of the 10, instead of going and hanging out and, and celebrating with Uncle Joe, they went and they found Jesus. Verse 15 says, one of them turned back when he saw that he was healed. He thanked God with a loud voice. He got down on his face, defeated Jesus and thanked him. He was from the country of Samaria. This guy had to go back and find Jesus. I mean, he had to go all the way back. He had to look at where Jesus was. He had to find him. And then he got down on his knees and he praised God. And here's what, what you have to see here in all of this is that 10 people got healed physically from leprosy, but only one person got close to Jesus. Only one person got close to Jesus. And here's what I don't want you to miss today is that gratitude is the path to the power and to the presence of God in your life. Gratitude is the path to the power, to the presence of God in your life. Some of us, I think what happens is we're like the nine who got healed and we, our life has been transformed. We've been changed. We have hope because of Jesus. And then we wonder why we're not close to Jesus. And then we wonder why it feels like Jesus is far away and God is, is distant in our lives. And we're like, I don't understand. I know I'm healed. I know I've been transformed, but I don't, I don't know where God is in my life. Hear this again. Ten people were healed. One person was close to Jesus. Gratitude is the path to the power and to the presence of God in our lives. This man understood that. This man was healed, and then he got close to Jesus as a result of his gratitude. And he was so overcome with how his life had been trained, changed and transformed that I love this. It was with a loud voice, it says, he was praising God and giving thanks. The Greek word here is literally mega phone, mega loud phone voice, and that's where we get our word megaphone from, right? It's like this guy was shouting like he had a megaphone. The, the, and, and just think about this for a second. It's pretty amazing, the shift, because for years, this man had to shout like with a megaphone everywhere he went, unclean, unclean. And he was shouting everywhere he went, megaphone, a megaphone, megaphoning that truth. I'm unclean. Stay away from me. And then here we are on the other side of this story, and instead now he has the megaphone out and he's shouting, I've been healed, I've been transformed, I have, I have a reason to praise God, to thank God. And as I looked at that and the difference between this man kind of amplifying the gratitude or amplifying the truth that he had been unclean, I, it struck me is that every single one of us has a choice. What are we going to amplify in our lives? What are we going to megaphone in our lives? What are we going to bring attention to in our own lives? Every one of us has a choice. Our, our life, your life speaks. 
Either you're going to amplify the praise in your life or you're going to amplify problems in your life. If you're going to megaphone in your life things that grate on you, which is really easy to do and it feels kind of good sometimes, or you're going to megaphone the gratitude in your life. Are you going to talk about things that annoy you or answers to prayer? See, like, the people in your life, the, every one of them, they, they experience this in, in your life, and what did they hear more? Do they hear more about what God has done in your life or your like frustration, flavor of the week and moment? Because all of us amplify one or the other every day of our lives. Our lives are speaking, are amplifying, are megaphoning either our problems or our praise every day of our lives. And this man gets it. This man does what we all need to do. He came back and he praised and he brought gratitude. But so often, friends, I'm just saying we miss this. You don't even might, you might not realize it, the gratitude gap that's in your life. So often we're like the 90%, the nine out of 10 who went on with their lives and, they, and, they, and we miss coming back with gratitude. In fact, this is kind of hard um, if you've been a Christian for a while. I think the longer that you've been a Christian, oftentimes the harder it is for us to remember to bring gratitude in our lives. Like, the, I think about the classic song, Amazing Grace. It says, how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. But what about like the next week? How, how precious did it appear then? Like how precious was it the next year? How precious was it 10 years later? Sometimes we've been a Christian for so long that we miss the magnitude of the miracle that we've experienced in our lives. And it's not fresh like it was the very first moment that we experience it. You know, there's a, a line in this verse that actually speaks to that truth. And uh, it's an easy line to skate by. It seems like kind of this like little kind of by the way phrase that's thrown in there. And it says that he was from the country of Samaria. Now, Luke probably was kind of smiling as he said that, because this was a theme in his scriptures again and again, and his, uh, and his uh, account of the life of Jesus. Why was this such a significant thing? Because Samaritans were supposed to be the last ones that would understand what God had done for them. Samaritans were like half-breeds. Samaritans were outsiders. Uh, outsiders. Samaritans were foreigners. Samaritans were clueless, okay? They were supposed to be clueless, and yet here it is in this verse, in this story, it's the outsider, it's the Samaritan who understands and expresses gratitude. I think that's, I think that's still true today, honestly. It's like the person who's so far from God who finally experiences God, God's grace, and it feels so big and so huge to them when they finally receive it, there's just this gratitude that wells up in their heart. And the same thing is true that oftentimes it's the outsiders that come to church and experience what God has for them here that express the most gratitude because God does something in their lives. And so for you, I mean, maybe you grew up Lutheran, maybe you grew up Catholic, charismatic, Baptist, Anabaptist, Methodist, and you went to church every single su Sunday. I just want to say, be careful not to miss the magnitude of the miracle of what God's done in your life. It's so easy to do. It's so easy for us to take it for granted rather than give back gratitude. And Jesus points this out. In fact, uh, verse 17 says this, Jesus asked, where are, were there not 10 men who were healed? Where are the other nine? Is this stranger from another country the only one who turned back to give thanks to God? You have to wonder how Jesus said this. I'm not sure what his voice was like, but I kind of feel like maybe he said it and he was just a little bit hurt. Like there were 10 people whose lives were completely changed, but they never came back and he never had the chance to celebrate them celebrate with them. He, he never had the chance to see the look in their eyes. It, he, he had blessed these 10 people. Their lives were completely different, but they forgot to come back and to bless him. And this sentence actually in the original language is phrased in such a way that it almost kind of gives a little additional bite to it. Jesus literally says in the original language, the other nine, where? In other, in other words, the emphasis is on the last word, the where. The other nine, where, where are they? It doesn't seem like when Jesus asked this question, though, that he's really looking for an answer. Jesus, Jesus knew where they were. He knew what was happening. He was saying this to make a point. Ten were healed, but look, only one of you 
captured and took advantage of the opportunity, the privilege to come back and present praise, the opportunity to come back and present gratitude. And we read this story and we think, and I don't know, my reaction, probably your reaction is, how could these nine guys have missed it? What were they doing? Where were they? How could they possibly have missed the chance to come back and say thank you to Jesus? And that's our reaction. It's pretty obvious to us on the outside looking in. But don't be too quick to to jump into judgment because how often do we do the same thing to God? How often do we miss saying thank you for something he's done for us? How often do we, do we feel grateful maybe in our hearts, but we don't express it? We don't say it to him. See, I, I think, in fact, if you were to interview these nine guys who had experienced transformation, had experienced their life change, who had experienced healing from leprosy, if you interviewed them and you said, hey, you know what, guys, tell me about this, they would have been like, oh, my gosh, it was amazing. There's this guy, he's awesome, his name's Jesus, and we were walking by, and he healed us, and you should have seen the way it happened. It was incredible. Wow, that was, that's amazing. So, like, are, you must be really grateful. Oh, I, of course I am. I am so grateful. This is so, this is amazing. Of course I'm grateful. See, what I'm trying to say is I'm sure they all felt grateful but they didn't express it. They didn't tell Jesus that. They didn't go out of their way to, to show gratitude to him. And so the other nine, where? Like, I wonder how often Jesus says that to us in our lives. I wonder how often he says that to me. See, uh, I'm coming to understand, I'm coming to this point to understand that there really is no such thing as unexpressed gratitude. That, that, like, is a contradiction in terms. It's, a, it's an oxymoron. In fact, I would say it like this. Unexpressed gratitude actually communicates ingratitude. It actually communicates ingratitude. In other words, so often unexpressed gratitude comes across, whether you realize it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, as taking someone or something for granted. Are you thankful for your spouse? Tell them. Do you have great kids? Go and tell them, right? Do you have, a, you have an awesome boss? When was the last time you said that to him or her? Do you have a coworker that just makes your life easier every day? They're amazing. When was the last time that you told them? There is no such thing as gratitude by osmosis. Like, that, that, that doesn't exist. You know, we don't just, like, feel gratitude, and it just kind of eludes out into everyone else around us. You have to bring intentionality if you want gratitude in your life. And by the way, one little side note. Is telling someone else that you're grateful for them um, and telling, so like if you have a spouse that you love and you brag on your spouse all the time and you talk about how awesome they are to everyone else, that doesn't count either. (laughs) You have to tell your spouse how you feel about them. And so here's, I have a little gratitude challenge for you. Here's some ways to close the gratitude gap. And I'm just going to give you five ideas, and you can add other ones in here, but I just pick one, okay? This is like a starting point. So close the gratitude gap. The first one is to go out of your way to tell someone how grateful you are for them. It doesn't just count to say, be like on the way home, like, hey, honey, uh, thanks. I love you. You're great. That doesn't count. You got to go out of your way, okay? Go out of your way. Uh, Text someone. Tell someone. Maybe it's someone that you haven't talked to in a while. Uh, Tell them you're grateful. Number two, don't just tell someone, but show them how grateful you are. I think sometimes there's a lot of dads, maybe in particular, if I could be honest, that are like, you know what? I feel grateful for my family. I love my family. And you have to ask, but are you, are you showing gratitude on your calendar? Do you, or do you show it with your actions as well? And so don't just tell someone, but with your calendar, with your actions, show them. Third one is this. Begin every conversation this week with something that you're grateful for. This is a real challenge, but it is a game changer. Just watch how when you start with something positive, how it changes every conversation from that point forward. It's so easy and it's so common for, for all of us to begin a conversation with something that's frustrating us. Oh, traffic was terrible. Oh, can you believe how hot it is? Rain again, whatever it is, something that's frustrating. And that changes the course of a conversation. My challenge is this week, do your very best every single conversation Try beginning with something that you're grateful for and watch how that changes things. The the fourth one is this. Try a gratitude journal for the rest of the summer. Um, I've been doing this for the last couple years. Total game changer. Uh, There is science that actually backs this up as well. 
It seems so simple, but write three things down every morning that you're grateful for. Just choose to start to focus on those things. It could be something simple. It doesn't have to be something big. And just that little thing makes such a big difference in the rest of your day. Um, Gratitude journal. And don't just do it for like a week. You got to do it for a little longer than that. And then the last one, if you haven't done this, sign up for Crossroads Summer of Soul Care Resources. You can do this. We're going to have resources this week that match what we're talking about here today. And so uh, you could get jump started with that. You could right now text the soul to that number and uh, finish out the summer strong the next couple weeks with that. But all of those things, no matter what it is, my encouragement is to practice because gratitude takes practice. There's a reason people say it's called practicing gratitude because it it is something that requires practice. It is not something that is natural for us. Just like other things in life that require practice to get good at it, gratitude requires practice. Practicing gratitude. It's not just an attitude of gratitude. That's great. It's practicing and choosing intentionality to live it out in your life. So 10 lepers met Jesus. 10 lepers had their lives completely changed, transformed. 10 people walk away healed, but only one came back. And I would say only one experienced healing, not just at a skin deep level, but they experienced healing at a soul level. They were, they, they were made whole. In fact, this verse 19 speaks to that. It says this, then Jesus said to them, get up and go on your way. Your trust in God has healed you. It's easy to miss this, but the word healed is in this passage twice. And the first time that Jesus says healed, didn't I heal 10 lepers? That word healed is referring to physical healing. It's a Greek word that refers to physical healing. It was a healing that was skin deep. It was a medical healing, right? But then then he says it here at the end, the same word healed, but it's not the same word. It's actually a different word for healed. It's sozo. And that word has a deeper connotation. This healing is not just a physical healing. It's a spiritual healing. This healing is not just a skin deep healing, a medical healing. This is a healing that's at the soul level. Sozo, this word sozo means saved in other passages. It means protected. It means prospered. It means made whole at a soul level. And so I want to read this last passage for you. The same word sozo is found in Romans 10, 9. And let me end with this. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be sozo. You will be healed. You will be healed, not just at a skin deep level, not just as a physical level, but but at a much deeper level, there will be a soul healing. You will be made whole. And so I want to pray for us. And uh, we got one more song after that. Will you uh, bow your heads? Let's pray together. Lord, we, uh, we just pray this morning that we would be the one, the one that returns. But so often we admit in this moment together that we're not the one. So often instead we're the nine that missed it. We're the nine that kind of just went about life. And while our life has been transformed, sometimes we don't tell you how grateful we are. Sometimes we don't show how grateful we are. Sometimes we don't live that out in our lives. And so, Lord, we don't just want to feel gratitude in our heart and assume that you know that we feel that way. We want to express it with intentionality. We want to practice gratitude together in this place. And Lord, I just know that as we practice gratitude together more and more, as we grow in this together more and more, as we're the kind of church that lives this out more and more, we're going to, we're going to find you showing up in our lives more. We're going to, we're going to see you in our church more because gratitude is the path to your presence. Gratitude is the path to intimacy with you. And that's what we want. We want to see you. We want to experience you. We want to know you. Lord, we know that you love us, but Lord, we want to come back and we want to express our gratitude. We want to get on our knees and say, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for how you've healed us. Thank you for how you've restored us. Thank you for how you've redeemed us, Lord, that we have a hope and a future because of you. We were dead. We had a death sentence called sin that was disintegrating our very soul. And now instead we have a hope. In the name of Jesus, we we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. This message was a part of the ministry of Crossroads Community Church. To support Crossroads and make more messages like this available, you can click Give Now in the description below. 
And to find out more information on all of Crossroads Ministries, go to crossroads140.com. If you enjoyed the message today, don't forget to follow us or subscribe to our channel. And we hope to see you again soon.